So we're going to continue our series, Follow Me, looking at Jesus, because he's just so good. He's just awesome. And this morning again, another, so what I love about Jesus, or what I love about the gospel, is the gospel is actually really simple. Hmm. We tend to make things complicated. Today's truth that Jesus reveals is another really simple truth. It's a simple, it would be, it, it would be maybe even easy for us to, uh, to accomplish or to do. The hard part is, is, you know, our mind and everything around us sometimes get in the way of us receiving what Jesus wants to give to us. And so this morning, I'm going to share with you what Jesus wants to give to us. I want to tell you that it's simple, knowing that it's challenging for us to walk in this. But let's look this morning. I don't know about you, I thought this would be a great topic right after we all served. We all did a whole bunch of work. And I want to talk about weariness this morning. And what God offers for those who are weary. Does anybody else say, I need, I need some rest. It's a holiday season. It's like, all right, whew, it's getting, getting going. It's like, it's supposed to slow down at the end of the year, but everybody knows the schedule actually just speeds up at the end of the year. All right? But we all experience sometimes this weariness, and it comes from all sorts of different factors, right? Sometimes we can all point, okay, I know this thing is happening. Like, okay, I could point to you this week, I had a, we, had, we had the Thanksgiving dinner, I could point to that. But sometimes, we could, to be honest, right, there's multiple factors that go into why we're weary. You know, maybe there's a significant uh, activity that we're going to do, maybe there's some kind of um, body frailty that some of us are going through, some illnesses or some pain um, or some surgery. Uh, you know, maybe there is some emotional heartbreak, you know, getting around the holidays and there's some kind of emotional thing that, that, that brings up this, this heartbreak, this emotion that come with it. Um, and other times maybe it's the consequences of sin. You tie all those things together and I can say, man, sometimes I just feel like I got a load that I'm carrying. I got a little bit of weariness. I got, I got a little bit of drag. Our burdens aren't always that simple, and sometimes I get really irritated when I share my burdens with people. I don't know if you get this way too, and and, and they're not, they can't just be they can't just be fixed by a simple cheer up. Things are bound to turn around. Anybody hear that one? <laughs> cheer up. I'm like, well, I can't cheer up. I actually got some things going on right now. I mean, I got I got a list of things. I got some emotion. I got some things that are tied down. I mean, like I I, I really am carrying something. You can't just put a smile on your face. Don't worry, joy of the Lord is your strength. I love that strength. Yeah. It's good. It's good to hear, right? It's like, yes. But I said, okay, now, now teach me something. I gotta I gotta walk that out. <laughs> how, how does the joy become my strength? <laughs> yeah. But I promise that we can relieve these complex burdens if we believe the simple power behind promise that we're going to look at. Jesus gives us a promise this morning, and this promise is strong enough to relieve our heaviest burdens. Amen. Amen. Jesus speaks a promise, we hold on to it, we believe it, it is powerful enough yes. to relieve our heaviest burdens. Yes. So let's look this morning, what is this promise to those who are weary? Matthew chapter 11, we're going to look at verse 28. 30 this morning. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. It says this. Come to me, all who are labored and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Who do you say? Read that one again. We'll just read that one again. This is this Jesus' words to us this morning. Come to me, all who are labored and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Mm 
There's a simplicity to Jesus' answer to our heavy burdens. This morning, his instruction to us, his encouragement to us, what do we do when our emotions are all tied up, when we have a heavy burden at work, when things in the family may not be perfect like I wanted it to, when maybe relationships are a little tattered right now, what does he say to us? And here's a 10-step plan of how we can get it all done and get it in order. Does he, like a, a, a Buddhist would say, there's a fourfold plan, plan to peace and, and peace-giving enlightenment? Does, does he say, you know, there's like a, the, maybe the Islamic faith, there, there'd be, you know, five pillars of peace through submission uh, that comes? No. He doesn't lay out a 10-step plan because, you know, us good Americans, we like to have our 10-step plan and our self-help gurus, right? Our five, you watch this five-minute clip and it'll solve all your issues in your life, right? No. Jesus speaks this. He simply offers himself. You who are heavy, you are burdened, you who need rest, Jesus says, come to me. I am the answer. I am the rest that you seek. I am the solution. I am the resolve of all issues. I am come to me. We cannot find our rest in ourselves. We cannot find our rest in our abilities to figure out complex problems. We can't find it even in our neighbor or our friends. Jesus says to us this morning, come to me. He offers himself. Yeah. And this simple promise, it, it is a simple comment, it could be really ridiculous, it could be crazy, right? If Jesus wasn't who he said he was, it would be crazy, right? It, it, that's what I think about some of these awesome, and, and some of these self-help things are, are great, and they, I think they do help us, you know, get a little bit further in, in different situations in our life. But if Jesus were just another another guy, it would be just as audacious as those little commercials that you see on Facebook pop up every once in a while. Watch this video, and it'll be the best thing in your life. But no, Jesus is who he says he is. John 1, verses 1 through 3, it reveals that Jesus is the eternal word made flesh. So he is the accumulation of all that is written and all that is revealed about God himself in, the flesh, in person. It isn't audacious because God and Jesus himself in Hebrews chapter 1 and 3, he is the creator. So all things in word, uh, all things in the world, all things in life, they came from him. It was his spoken word. It was he was the spoken word that created all things. And so when we think about how complex maybe we got ourselves into an issue, a complex burden that weighs down on us, and we say, Oh, well, who is there to understand? Yet the one who created all things. Think about that. The complexity of all living things, all matter, I mean, the you know, earth, and the, the middle of the solar system, and life, and how it exists. It, that one who spoke says, come to me. He has a simple promise, and it implies a power behind it more significant, greater than any burden that we carry. So, just like you may be asking, I have to ask, you know, this, this seems too simple, so I do need, uh, can you give me a little help, Jesus? What does this mean? How do I come to you? I mean, if, if you are all that I need, if you have all the power, and you are able to do all things, how do I come to you? And in this passage in Matthew, it kind of tells us, and it kind of gives us a bit in the context, shows us the difference between those who come to him and those who didn't come to him. In Matthew uh, chapter uh, 11, just before this, he speaks some rebukes. So in Matthew chapter 11, let's look at this, in verse 20, he, he renounces some cities. 
And it will point to us what we need to do. How do we come to him? It says this in verse 20. He began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. They did not believe on him. They did not repent. It says this. Woe to you, Charizard. Woe to you, Bethesda. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre or Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have been Sorry, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will not be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. <coughs> so what happened here? Jesus begins in, in Matthew 11, 20-24, and then it continues in chapter 12, verse 1-8, rebuking the cities and the religious leaders that saw the first-hand miracles of God. They saw the power of God on display, and yet they didn't believe. What was their fault? They saw how marvelous and how powerful Jesus was walking on earth, doing his ministry, opening the blind eyes, casting out the demons. <laughs> they saw these works, they, they saw how powerful it was, but yet they still they, they didn't believe. What is it that Jesus is asking us to do when he says, come to me? If we look at the context, it's in contrast to their disbelief. So Jesus is saying, believe in who I claim to be. Therefore, what I'm able to do for you. So half of the battle as a believer coming to Jesus is choosing to believe that he's able to do and solve the issue that we currently find ourselves in. The burden that we find ourselves under. Jesus, you truly are the answer. His rebuke to the city and to the religious leaders is they saw all these things, they knew who he was, they knew the scripture, but yet they didn't believe he was the answer to exactly what they were going through. And this is where our hearts are tested. This is where we find ourselves. Will we believe in him? Will we believe that his promises are true? Will we trust in him in these situations? I don't know about you, nobody has to convince me that I need rest. I'm like, yes, I know I need, I need this burden lifted from me. I, I know I need this trial and to be over with. I mean, I, I know it. But will we believe, no matter how long it may take? Or we want it just an instant, right? We want some instant, <laughs> instant Jesus. Yeah. Oh, Jesus, just give me that instant pudding package, right? So you put it in there, mix it up, we're good. 30 minutes, we're eating pudding, right? No. We believe. We are steadfast. We come to him. Jesus, I know you are the answer. We need to rest on the surety of God fulfilling his promise. Come to me. He says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, to cast our anxieties on him because he's going to care for us. But, oh, if I, but, if I, but if I give them to you, then I don't have any control over the, the results. Sometimes we didn't realize that it was our control over the results that got us in the mess that we're in. And Jesus is saying, go ahead and give it to me because I'm going to care for it much better than what you can yourself. Trust me. Oh, that works hard. It's challenging, isn't it? Trust me. Trust in me with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. This is from Proverbs 3, 5. That's right. Don't worry. I know I gave you the brain that you have. I gave you the ability. I gave you the giftedness you have. I gave you all that you got. I, it was me that did it for you. But still, in all that I gave and all that you are and all that you're able to do, lean on me. Put your strength back on me. Come to me. 
come to me. And in Matthew here, it says this, that you will find rest for your soul. Let's look at that a little bit. Rest for our soul. The only way for us to find rest is in hope. Is in hope, is in faith. You know, this is what, this is what uh, marketing those products they take advantage of. Hey, watch this, watch this movie, put your hope in this thing, watch in this game, watch this, and you'll, you'll get there. <laughs> I loved our, our, at our MC on, on Wednesday, we've been going through the gospel, and we talked on Wednesday about being a child of God. If, there's, if we believe fully that we're a child of God, what implications would that have in our lives? And part of what we were saying is if we believe we're a child of God, then we would be very secure. Why? Because in God, as this child in Romans, it reveals that we have an inheritance, that we're co-heirs with Christ. And so we have a future inheritance established for us, already purchased for us. We are in Christ, and so there's a hope that there's a future for us. And so is it, then how would that, what, what implications would that have in our everyday life? And somebody spoke up and they said, Man, if I truly believe I was a child of God and that I was a co-heir with Christ, that I have a future inheritance secured for me, then when, then when people come to me and say, hey, if you try this one more thing, it will get you this. Come on over here. I'll show you how to get more power. I'll show you how to get more ability. She, the, the person said, it wouldn't face me because I know I already have that in Christ. Right? So when we, when we put our hope in Christ, our soul finds rest. When we put our belief on the things that we have in Christ, our soul finds rest. Psalm 62, the psalm after what we read this morning, it says this, For God alone, O my soul, Wait in silence. For my hope is from him. He is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rest my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. My strength is God. My fortress is God. My protection is God. My foundation is God. Everything that I need is in Him. When we believe on this, our striving ceases. When we believe that Christ has done the greatest work ever able to be done, my soul finds rest. My striving Cease. I cease to try to accomplish something greater because I know the greatest work has already been done. And so it gives me rest, it gives me peace that my approval or my striving won't accomplish something more. I can just freely work unto Him and it becomes a joy. Amen. Striving cease. When we believe on Jesus, Jesus knows that he is the only salvation. Think of it. Jesus is the word. He's made for, He is the word. He knows that he is our only salvation. He knows that he is our fortress. He knows that he is our mighty rock, our refuge. He knows that he is the answer to all solution, all problems are. He is the answer to every question, every concern, every fear, every need. So that is his, in knowing that, in that place of understanding, in that place of confidence, then he can ask to us, come. Find the rest that your weary soul seeks. Then he goes into, take my yoke 
and learn from them. Pastor Bob, Pastor Andrew, why have we been focusing on the way of Jesus and on the life of Jesus, on his teachings and on his miracles? Why? Because we know that when we take from him, when we take his yoke, when we learn from him, our souls will find rest. We will be at peace. We will know with certainty the direction of our life should go. The question that I begin to ask myself is, He promises rest. Why does He tell us to put on a yoke? A yoke is often placed on on an animal, right, in order for them to work. <coughs> and I opened the message this morning saying, some of us are weary this morning because we're working. <laughs> we're tired. We've got enough on our plates. We've carried enough burdens on our shoulders. We have enough problems we're trying to solve. Well, God, why would you want me to work? Maybe our understanding of work needs to be changed this morning. What is Jesus asking us to do when he asks us to take on his yoke? Let's look. John chapter 6, verse 29. John chapter 6, verse 29. I love it. It starts this way. This is the work of God. This is it. This isn't Andrew made up words. This isn't what uh, theologians have thought. This is from the Word of God Himself. He says this. This is the work of God. That you believe in Him who He has sent. John 6, 29. This is the work of God. That you believe in Him who He has sent. So what do we do what, with our weary soul? What do we do? Well, how do we come to Jesus? What was the rebuke to the cities and the, lead, the religious leaders? It was they didn't believe. They saw the works and yet they didn't believe. What is our work as believers? What is our work to find rest? To believe. Work is to believe in him who said it. Jesus answers this in John chapter 15, verse 4, and he says it this way. He says, Abide in me. Abide in me. Like a branch in a vine, right? There's no work involved in the branch abiding in the tree. It's part of it. It it, it breathes from it. It it lives in it. It gets all of its nutrients through it, right? It is there. The work is not working. It happens as it exists. As we believe, as we stay, as we come to Christ, as we say, yes, Jesus, all that you have, your way, not yes, Lord, as we exist in him like the branch exists in the vine, we abide in him. We have our strength. Believe and abide. That's the work that we have to do. That's fine. That's in the the theory. That's the work that we have to do. Believe (coughs) and abide. God requires us faith. I can sum up believing about faith. Believing on Him. Resting in Him. Putting our hope in His promises. That's the yoke that Jesus calls us to join Him in. Come, let me do all the work for you. And He gets to the Walk along with me in my ways. As I accomplish all things in you, and as I do all the things you need, as I do it all, put your faith in what I've done. Put your faith in my promises, and I, I do all the work. What's happening in this yoke is a beautiful exchange. 
as I alluded to before, as maybe you've heard me say before, the greatest work has already been accomplished. The greatest work, the greatest burden that we carry is the weight of our sin. And Jesus takes the place of our penalty. He takes the place of what we owe. And he says, on me I will lay all burdens, all iniquity, all mistakes, all consequences of sin, of not right living. It will all be on me. I will take the way, I will take that burden, and I will accomplish the work of the Father. I will go to the cross on your behalf. I will pay the penalty that you owe. His work and His work alone fully addresses our sin problem. But in that, in Philippians 4.19, He supplies all of our need. Our need is not the next big thing. Our need is not the next greater finance. Our need is not that all things would be resolved and at peace. Our need is not that we would find a beautiful home in this neighborhood and have two baths and three bedrooms and a nice little garage, right? Our need is in this alone, that our soul has found peace. And that comes when we believe on Jesus. And in that, and if we truly, oh, come on, if we truly believe on that in all our, in the deepest part of our being, then no matter what the burden of life that we carry, it can, it cannot remove the peace that we have. When we truly believe all that Jesus has done and all that He is, the promises that He has for us that are true, that are yes and amen, and there is a peace that we have that cannot be pen penetrable. It can never go away. No matter what may come along, we know our future is secure. love this in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. It says this. It says, look to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, Amen. who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand, the throne of God. Amen. So what do we do? How do we come from underneath these burdens, come out from underneath the burdens. We must believe. We must believe in the promises that Christ has in us. We must abide in Him and follow His steps. The light yoke of Jesus calls for us to put it on. Calls for us to abide in Him. Abide under Him. It is the only yoke that will actually give rest. Believe on him and the work that he's accomplished in our life. Jesus' invitation for us this morning is for us to come. To believe on him. To believe that he has the answer. To believe that he's the way. To believe that he has removed the penalty of sin in our life. That now we live in the good graces of the Father in heaven who is good and always has good and perfect gifts for us. We all bear burdens. They all have something on our heart and our minds this morning that we wish wouldn't be the way it is. Jesus says, come, cast your care. Amen. Come, cast your anxiety on let him worry about those things which you cannot control. Lean into him and not on your own abilities. It's important that we also remember that we together are the body. And as I mentioned this morning, when we greet one another, it's not just a greet, hello, goodbye. 
It is a spiritual act that we would encourage one another on a regular basis. A foundation of our faith is that we have each other. Mostly, it's to remind each other where to find the rest. We have each other, not that we would solve each other's problems. Though it's always encouraging when I get to pray with one another, we get to pray with each other. And it's encouraging when maybe we've been through a similar thing and we can encourage one another and tell each other good wise things and good wise steps to take. But it's also our main concern is that we can encourage one another where we find rest. Remember to take your anxieties and your cares and your worries to Christ. Let me pray with you. Let me carry your burdens with you. Not that I would shovel them on my back, but that we would take Together, your burden is the one who promises a rest for your weary soul. That's why we have each other. So whether it's striving, whether it's approval, whether it's... The list could go on what we carry. This morning, the invitation again is, by Jesus himself, the word may flesh, he says, come. Come believe that I have the answer. Come cast all your worries and anxieties on me. Come, and I will give you rest. Can we come to the Lord this morning? Let me pray, and then we can respond by coming.